I looked over and that was happening. And I was like, slow down, buddy. I was like, what? Like, you're not getting a refill. He's like, but I just really love juice. I said, that's great. But you're just getting one glass. Now, I know some parents are that way because of the sugar content of the juice. I'm that way because I don't want to pay for four juices. All right? (laughs) And before I can continue this conversation any further, my parents, who are at the breakfast with us, say, we'll get him another one. I'm like, what? No, he's fine. Well, he'd already heard we'll get him another one. And so did the waiter who was at the table. And so out two minutes later comes another juice. And at that point in time, my sons realized it's unlimited juice at breakfast day, all because grandma and grandpa are there and grandma and grandpa are paying. Now, grandparents... They're the best, especially new grandparents, because generally they're at the age where the filter's starting to go, but it's not completely gone. You know, I mean, once you get up there a little bit and you go into great grandparent category, that just can be a little awkward because then the filter is completely gone and you're looking around like, I'm going to have to apologize to that stranger and that stranger and... Yeah, they had a point there. Uh, but that's stranger. Yeah, I mean, it can just get, but new grandparent, man, that is, that's really, that is that's just like the greatest people ever. Because they realize all the things that they freaked out about as parents that were so trivial that they don't matter. Now they see their kids and they just want to torture their children still a little bit, getting them back for all the things that they did growing up that they're still upset about. And so they still hit them a little bit. I, it's It's great. But at the end of breakfast, my kids had downed about three juices apiece, all because grandma and grandpa were picking up the check. Because if I was, it would have been water after the apple juice. And when I was growing up, it was very different, it was very different circumstances. It was one juice, and that's it. And after that, you're getting water by the very same people who willingly and with a smile upon their face bought each of my children three juices. Three juices at one meal. That's just the beauty of grandparents. But I learned something very early on in life by going to breakfast with my juice. And that was you have to delay instant gratification. You have to delay instant gratification. Because if you drink your juice as soon as it comes to the table under parental rule and not grandparental rule. I don't even know if that's how you say it, but we're just going to go with it. If you drink your juice all at once and you're at breakfast with your parents, that's it. And they're going to look at you and say, well, you should have saved some for your meal. You do it with grandparents. That's okay, honey. Bring them another round. But when you're out with your parents, you learn really early on. I have to delay my joy of juice. I have to take some time and make sure that there's some that's safe for when the bacon and the eggs get there. And if you're a sausage person, we'll talk about your life choices later. It's bacon, clearly. But when the bacon and the eggs arrive, then you still want to have some juice. You don't want to eat bacon and eggs with water. That is un-American. It's really just not... If you're, if you're doing breakfast with bacon... And well, with ba- with sausage instead of bacon, you're just doing it wrong. But if you're doing it with bacon and eggs and water, you might as well have ordered sausage. You're also doing it wrong. You need to have some juice that goes along with the bacon and the eggs. It just sets breakfast apart and makes it that much more incredible. And I learned very early on as a kid that if I was going to be able to have some juice with my bacon and my eggs when we were at a restaurant, then I couldn't drink it all at once. I had to slow down and I had to pace myself And I had to save some for later. And that is the same principle that we need to understand regarding money. Now, a lot of of people walk through life like they have a grandparent sitting at the breakfast table with them. And that they can just go through their finances like they would go through their juice. And it's okay because somebody else is going to come alongside and provide them a cushion. Somebody's going to come alongside and comfort their fall and just continue to provide and make sure that they have a constant stream of resources. And yet we've seen what has happened. The average American household carries over $137,000 of debt. 
Americans owe over 1.5 trillion in student loan debt. The average credit card debt is $8,300, and 61% of American adults don't have enough saved to cover a $1,000 emergency. And all of this predictably leads to money being the leading cause of divorce in our society. And so where we started this idea of currency is we saw that money reveals our motives. The money reveals our motives. And last week we saw that God wants us to be responsible stewards, and so we need to put a plan in place. We need to have a plan in place for how we're going to use our resources. And today we're going to see the importance, the importance of setting aside money and the importance of saving, and how when we understand God's design for money, this is, this is so important to God's design for money, that we save and we build And so we're going to look at some different verses throughout Proverbs today. If you have your Bible apps on your phones, you can follow along under the events. Otherwise, feel free to follow along on the screens. We're going to dive in today, starting in Proverbs 10, 4 and 5, where we read this. A slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. He who gathers in summer is a prudent son, but he who sleeps in harvest is a son who brings shame. And so the first thing that we have to understand is the very best tool that any of us have, the very best tool that any of us have to to building wealth, the very best tool that any of us have to earning money is to work, is to work. This is the greatest tool that any of us have. God has given us all abilities. He's given us all gifts and unique talents. And we should try to find, to the best of our ability, outlets that we can utilize. Those gifts and those talents that bring us joy so that when we go to work, it's not a chore. It's not something that we wake up each morning dreading, but instead it's something that we're excited to do. We find ourselves in in outlet that allows us to just find joy and fulfillment in what we do. And this is why if, if you're coming towards the end of high school and, and you're trying to make a decision about college, don't feel like there's this pressure on, don't feel like you've got to declare a major and then you're trapped in that major no matter what. Take some time and figure out what you really want to do in life. That doesn't mean you just sit on the couch in your parents' house during that entire course of time and like, I'm just figuring it out, mom and dad, lay off me, while you went out and bought a new video game the night before and have played it for the last 18 hours. That's not what that means. But what it does mean is feel free to take some time and really figure out what you want to do. And don't put this artificial deadline but you have to have a plan. And that is going to be something that we come to over and over and over again today and something we saw last week. You have to have a plan. If you want to be successful with money, if you want to be successful in life, you have to to devise a plan for how you're going to get there. And understand that oftentimes the plans that we lay out take many detours and oftentimes look a lot differently than the way we thought they would look. And yet, we have to have something that we're working towards. And so don't put an artificial deadline in place and then you find yourself stuck in a career and in a job that you absolutely hate. But take the time and figure it out. And then once once you enter the workforce, make sure you find yourself in an employment situation that brings you joy. It's something that you like. And that doesn't mean that every day you go to work, it's going to be just the greatest day of your life. There are going to be days that are miserable, and there are going to be days that you're just like, oh, this is awful. Why am I doing this? But if there aren't any days of joy, and if there aren't any times of fulfillment, then you're probably in the wrong career, or at least the wrong line of work, or at least working for the wrong company. And this isn't to say, well, then just fire off your email today that you're quitting and you're never going back. No, that's not to say that. But what it is to say, if you find yourself in a place where you're absolutely miserable and you aren't finding any joy and you aren't finding any fulfillment in your work, that's never how it was designed to be. So start the process now and say, what is it that's bringing me to this place that I don't have any joy and that I'm not fulfilled? And decide, is it your expectations? Is it your pay scale? 
Is it something that you feel like you were promised that hasn't been fulfilled? Or is it you're just doing something that you never wanted to do in the first place? And really figure out what that is. Because life is too short for you to walk through life every day miserable at a job that you hate. So figure out what you really want to do and then go find a place that values you and cares about you as an individual and go and work and be happy and find joy in that process and work hard. Be hard workers. He who gathers in summer is a prudent son. The hand of the diligent makes rich, but he who sleeps in harvest is a son who brings shame. Figure out what you want to do and then work hard at it. Be a hard worker. Be somebody who takes pride in the effort that you put forward. Be somebody who works diligently and who goes out and also work smart. Don't just work hard, but work smart. And so we have a situation here where he understands that his best opportunity to gather is in the summer. So that's what he goes and he does. He goes and he, where he can have the most impact, where he can gather the most. So you have to work hard, but you also have to work smart. It's not enough just to work hard if you're not working smart as well. You'll just be spinning in circles. And you'll be working yourself to death, but you'll never see the progress. And so this can be a very uncomfortable thing because what it forces us to do is it forces us to assess, are the things that I'm doing working? Am I being successful? If the answer is yes, then ask yourself, how can I do more of that? But if the answer is no, then ask yourself, what do I need to change? What needs to be different so that when I am working so hard... I can see different results. It starts with effort. You have to work hard, and yet there isn't only a question of effort. Effort isn't enough. You also have to complement your hard work. You have to complement your effort with working smart and making sure you're striking at the right times, making sure the opportunities that you see are really worth following after because there are going to be a lot of great opportunities that present themselves, and yet not every opportunity is one that you should follow. And so it's understanding, is this something that I should follow or not? It's doing the due diligence. It's understanding that you're going to make some mistakes in that, and you're going to try some things that aren't going to work, and you're going to try some things that are going to work. And so latch on to the things that work and do more of those. And be quick to write off the things that don't work and throw those aside. Work hard and work smart. And then have goals. Have goals in the process. Say, where do I want to be in one year, in three years, in five years? What do I want this to look like? And make sure that you have something that you're aiming at and define success. Define success because if you don't, it will continually change. So have goals and understand that you're not going to be able to accomplish as much in one year as you're going to be able to accomplish in five years, and that's okay. But understand what you need to do in the one year in order to make it so that you can be where you want to be in year five. Have some goals along the way and measure what success is so you know what to track. Because if you, don't have a, if you don't have a defined idea of what success is and you don't have anything to track, you're never going to know whether or not you're meeting, meeting your standard. And it's always going to change. Work hard. Work smart. All this starts with find something that you love. Find something that doesn't feel like a chore for you to go and to do. Find something that brings you joy and fulfillment that you just can't get enough of. Go after that. And once you find that passion, and once you find something that you love to do, then you work hard at it. But you also work smart at it. And you make goals along the way, and you track and measure whether or not you're being successful. And this is so important because our, our occupations are the greatest tool that any of us have to build wealth. So make sure that if you're going to be spending that much time and energy and effort at something, it's something that you love. And it's something that brings you a sense of fulfillment. And it's not a chore and you're not waking up every day hating to go do what you're going to spend so much of your life doing. Wealth gained hastily. 
will dwindle. But whoever gathers little by little will increase it. The next principle we see is this, that wealth gained quickly oftentimes will dwindle. But whoever gathers little by little will increase it. You want proof of this? 70% of million-dollar lottery winners wind up bankrupt. 70% of lottery winners who win millions or more wind up bankrupt. There was a gentleman named William. His friends called him Bud Post. He won $16.2 million in the Pennsylvania lottery in 1988. $16.2 million in the Pennsylvania lottery in 1988. And by 1989, he was more than $1 million in debt within one year's time. The Washington Post would run a story with him, and in that story he said, I wish it never happened. It was totally a nightmare. During the span of that year, a former girlfriend sued him successfully for a third of his winnings, and his brother was arrested for hiring a hitman to take him out, hoping that he would gain a portion of the inheritance. Didn't didn't even know that he would. He just was hoping that he would gain a portion of the inheritance, and so he hired a hitman to murder his brother. After sinking money into family businesses, Post sank into debt. And he spent time in jail because a bill collector came out to the house and he fired a gun over his head. I was much happier when I was broke, he told the Washington Post. After he was released from jail, he lived quietly on $450 a month in food stamps until his death in 2006. Unfortunately, this story isn't unique. And what it tells us is that so many of us have convinced ourselves that if only we had more money, it would be the solution to all of our money problems. If only we had a windfall, if only we had more money, it would be the solution to all of our money problems. And yet what this highlights is the trouble is oftentimes our behavior, not our finances. The trouble is oftentimes our behavior and not our finances. And statistic after statistic shows us that when people earn more, they spend more. And so if you find yourself today in a, in a situation where you're like, things are really tight and I'm broke, and if only we had this just one windfall, if only one thing would change, then we would be set free and everything would be great. Well, seven out of ten lottery winners who win a million dollars or more tell a very different story. And what it tells us is it's the behavior behind what has put us in the situation to begin with that is really what needs addressed. And that is the biggest problem. And that's why we talked last week about it's so vital that we have a budget in place, that we tell our money where to go and what to do. It's so important. So that which is earned hastily will dwindle. But that which is earned little by little will grow and develop. And this is why it is so important for you to save money. Save money. Make it a principle. Make it a habit. Every time you get paid to save money. Start if, you, if you're, I don't know where to start. We're broke. I don't know where to start. I don't know what to do. Start by saving for an emergency. Some people call it an emergency fund. Some people call it a rainy day fund, whatever it may be for you. There's a difference there in some people's terminology because they would say, well, the emergency fund's for a legitimate emergency, whereas some people would say a rainy day fund's when you feel bored and want to go shopping. And I would just say, if you're broke, don't go shopping. You're good, all right? You're, you're good. So I don't care what you call it. But set up yourself a savings account and start putting some money away. If, if you haven't started anywhere, there are some great tools online. There are some great calculators online where you can just follow really basic things and save $1,000 within a year's time. And if you started nowhere and you're like, this is impossible, then I would just challenge you. Do that. Challenge yourself. If you start today, just put... It, every week you grow it by a dollar. So the first week you do one dollar, the second week you do two dollars, the third week you do three dollars. What you need to understand is Christmas is going to be really tight. 
because you're going to be putting $200 away in December, so you might want to factor that in. But get yourself in the habit now of saving. So maybe you want to do 20 bucks a week. And if you do that for 50 weeks, you have $1,000. And so get yourself in the habit, whatever it takes, to start saving money. And after you fully fund your emergency fund or your rainy day fund, and after you wipe out debt, then build wealth. Build your wealth. And understand that very seldom, if ever, is it the get-rich-quick scheme or the windfall that makes people wealthy. The vast majority of people who are wealthy have accomplished that by disciplined living and saving little by little. Saving. And so start with a savings account. We talked last week. You can go to a website called bankrate.com and you can see all the different interest rates that the banks are paying out. And you can, un, you can see whether or not you need to have a minimum deposit in order to open that account. You want to find some, an account that's FDIC insured so that even if it's an internet bank, if it's FDIC insured, it has the same protections as a standard bank account that if the bank were to be hacked or something were to occur, that your money is insured by the government just as if a, a physical bank were robbed. It's the same principle. Find the highest paying interest rate with the, with the minimum that you can afford. Make sure the interest rate's one that isn't a gotcha rate. Like, we'll pay you 3% for the first month, and then after that it's 0.3%. Find, find the best rate going forward, and then open that account if you don't have anything. But start putting money in there little by little and watch it grow. And don't touch it unless it's a legitimate emergency and not there's this really great sale going on right now that we have to get this item. And then after you've saved and after you've paid off your debt, start to invest. Start to invest. This is why, for those of you who are young and just starting out in your careers, it's so vital that you start saving for retirement right away. And I understand you're like, I'm retirement. That's never going to happen. It will be here before you know it. And so start saving when you're young because of the because of the appreciation of what happens as the market grows, as the interest grows, as your money then makes money for you. And so based on how risk averse you are, you may want to invest in stocks or mutual funds or bonds or real estate or precious metals. You you have to determine what is right for you, but you also have to determine that you understand something. And it's not because a friend told you about it. It's not because you saw an incredible pop-up ad about it online. It's not because an actor from a 1970s sitcom was talking about it on a news channel that you love, and they're telling you what a great investment this is. You have to make sure that you can explain what you're investing into somebody in a couple sentences and actually understand what you're talking about. Otherwise, it's not right for you. So understand what your money's going to and understand what you're investing in. Because there are a lot of ways that you can be taken advantage of. There are a lot of people who present themselves as wanting to be in your best interest, but who aren't necessarily in your best interest. There are investment brokers who don't have to act in your best interest. And so you really need to understand how are they being compensated. Are they being compensated because I buy a product and whether that product goes to zero and I lose everything, they still make a great commission? Are they compensated that way? And if you decide, well, that sounds fair, that's how I want to pay somebody, then go with that broker. Or do you want to find a broker who is, is a fiduciary and who has to put you in what is best for you, regardless of whether or not it pays out the biggest commissions for them? That's a choice that you have to make. You have to make those choices, and you have to find somebody who's willing to explain the details of what you're investing into you without being upset at you and without trying to rush you on, because this is your money. God has entrusted it to you to be a steward of it. And so what matters is what you understand. What matters is what you are doing. And so make sure that you get yourself linked with people who care about you and who are willing to answer all of your questions, who are accessible and available to you when you have questions, and who are willing to explain things to you to the point that you fully 
understand them and can explain them to somebody else. Only deal with the people who are willing to do that and who want to make you feel comfortable. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the sinner's wealth is laid up for the righteous. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the sinner's wealth is laid up for the righteous. So when we follow God's plan for money, here's what happens. We accumulate, and it is not evil, and it is not wrong. We accumulate money, and we manage money to the point that we can leave some, that we can leave a legacy behind us. This is God's design for money. And I know that there are people out there who would tell you, that, oh, it's, it's wrong for you if you love Jesus. It's wrong for you to build a wealth portfolio. And there's all kinds of people who under the guise of Jesus will judge people who've been successful and will judge people that say, oh, they don't need that. They, what do they need that? that? They're living way too luxuriously. No, 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 no. This is God's plan that we would manage money well, that money would never drive us. It would never be the thing that drives us. Instead, we would drive money, that we would tell money where to go and what to do, but that we would follow God's plans and God's principles, and we would be disciplined and responsible, and we would take the approach that we are managing what God has entrusted to us, and we would be good stewards of it, and we would see it grow, and we would accumulate, and not feel bad about that, and not flaunt that, but instead use this incredible resource for good, and do great things with it. Precious treasure and oil are in a wise man's dwelling, but a foolish man devours it. Precious treasure and oil are in a wise man's dwelling, but a foolish man devours it. All the apple juice in the world is available to the wise man in his home. But the foolish man, as soon as it's brought to his table, as soon as he sees it with his eyes, can't wait to consume it. And then it's gone. So this is a question of wisdom. So how can we be wise? And how can we win? We need to, we need to have a plan. And we need to pace ourselves. We need to understand that everything we see we're not entitled to. And we need to understand that everything that we see that we want we don't need to have right now. We need to start to delay gratification. We need to start to see that some things need to wait and some things just aren't for us. We need to define success. We need to define what success is and what's enough and define it now if you haven't already. Define what's enough now because what's enough for me may be more than what's enough for you or maybe less than what's enough for you. And that doesn't mean that you're right and I'm wrong and that doesn't mean that I'm right and you're wrong. We can see things differently. But you better have in your mind what enough is. If you are going to manage money and not allow money to manage you, then you need to know what you're aiming at. You need to set a target that doesn't move. And you need to have that in place. Otherwise, you'll constantly be aiming at a moving target. And why is hunting so thrilling and so exciting? Because you actually hit the aiming target. You actually hit the moving target. It's not nearly as much, I mean, it's still fun, but it's not nearly as much fun just to go out and shoot at a standing target. But you also hit a lot more when you're shooting at a standing target. And you miss a lot more when you're shooting at a moving target. And this is too great. This is too important for us to risk missing in our lives. 
So to define and determine what enough is. And do it now. Because when you work hard and you find joy in your work and you have a plan in place and you start to succeed and then you invest and you grow your wealth little by little, you're going to look down one day and understand, wow, we've been successful. And then the question's going to appear of now what? And if you haven't fixed that target, The dangerous, subtle, sneaky sense of greed can creep in the heart. And it can lie there for years. But if we're not careful, what we've worked so hard for can drag us to places we never intended to go. So you better decide what you're aiming at and then refuse to let that move. Do you drink all your juice as soon as you get it? Because it feels good, because it's there, because it's caught your eye. It can be easy, it can be tempting, it can even feel good in the instant. And yet God has a better way and a better plan if we're willing to follow and allow our resources to grow and appreciate and allow us to do more good than we ever imagined possible. But we have to have a plan. And we have to know what we're aiming at. God help us. Help us be principled people. Help us be people who know what we're aiming at. Help us have a plan. I pray, God, for the person who hates going to work every day. And, God, I just ask that you would reveal to them whether that's because they're lazy, whether that's because they're doing something that they were never really designed to do. And if that's the case, then, God, I pray that you would just help them start to ask some tough questions, that they would seek advice and wisdom from other people. And you would help them determine what they should do instead. I pray for the person, God, who feels trapped, that just barely making ends meet, barely getting by. And God, I pray that you'd allow them to do the hard work of looking and saying, what needs to change? That they wouldn't be fooled into thinking if only they had a windfall that everything would be okay. God, I pray for the person who has been incredibly successful and has more resources now than they ever imagined. And I pray, God, that you would help them manage them well. And I pray that they would have a fixed target. And they would know what they're aiming at. God, I pray that we would honor you with our resources and that we would accomplish incredible good. That we would steward them well. And we would ultimately see that all of it belongs to you. So God, help us manage well. In your son Jesus' name we pray.